Hello, welcome to Life Matters. I'm your host, Brendan O'Connell. Well, have you ever asked yourself, what's the difference between contraception and a contraceptive? And why is there an uproar that's building as the truth gets out that there really is a connection in all likelihood between breast cancer and having a, a surgical or chemical abortion. Well, we have again today our, as our guest, uh, Dr. Joel Brind. He's a biologist and an endocrinologist. He teaches at Baruch College at the City University of New York. And he's also the past president of the Breast Cancer Prevention Institute. Well, welcome, Dr. Brind. Oh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, Dr. Brind, uh, there is uh, some confusion. What is the difference between contraception and a contraceptive? Well, usually when people talk about contraception these days, like in the current firestorm of political debate, they're really talking about the pill. And uh, those are that's really a particular class of contraceptives, things that effect contraception. And uh, these are really uh, treated now as if they're a woman's right, they're health care, universal health care, and all of that, and nobody... Nobody seems to be talking about the fact that these are actually synthetic carcinogenic steroid drugs. In fact, they're really the same kind of drugs that you go to jail for if a man uses them to uh, enhance his uh, muscle mass in order to uh, perform better athletically. He can go to jail for that, and some men have, some professional athletes. But these are really the same kind of drug. They're just the female version instead of the male version. When you take the female version of these drugs, they prevent pregnancy, and instead of building muscle, they will build breast tissue, which is one of the reasons that they actually cause breast cancer. And this is something that has been known for a long time to the uh, medical research community, but it has been successfully hidden from the public and uh, hidden under the uh, rubric of, uh, you know, a woman's right, uh, you know, as if uh, contraception is some kind of fundamental right uh, not only for women to have, but for girls to have, down to the age of 10, if you ask the Obama administration of Planned Parenthood, and to have free of charge. So it really boils down to, uh, to basically uh, a right to uh, fornication uh, for any woman, uh, no matter how old she is, even if she's uh, just become biologically a woman at the age of 10 or 12, she now has a right to unlimited fornication, and nobody is allowed to not only deny her uh, the benefit of protecting her from any consequences, but you have to do it free of charge, whether you're an insurance company or a Catholic charity or anybody else. So, I mean, this is, this is now what fundamental rights have come down to. I mean, I could ask without blaspheming at all, where in hell did that come from? Because it sure didn't come from the U.S. Constitution or any place uh, that's virtuous in, in any way. Well, I noticed that NARAL has uh, put forward a, uh, I believe it's NARAL, has put, has put $250,000 behind a commercial that they're airing in several states that uh, thanks the president for his most recent uh, edict, uh, which is part of, or regulation, that I guess uh, Kathleen Sebelius prompted him uh, to do, or she put out through her HHS uh, federal department. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, I don't really know. I'm not familiar uh, specifically with uh, with that uh, particular uh, uh, advertisement or any of the uh, literature they have, in particularly. But this is their whole part of their whole campaign. Is um, the 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 logic of it being? Uh, well, almost all women have at one time or other have used some sort of contraceptive device or, or uh, pill, and uh, therefore virtually everybody's in favor of it so they can concoct a story that somehow anybody who is against this latest edict that either the, uh, the uh, employer or the insurer or somebody has to uh, provide this stuff absolutely free of charge to every woman. Uh, otherwise, they're somehow against women because all women want this or all women uh, ha have had occasion to use it at some time or other or almost all women. And it's just, it's just this is the storyline uh, in order to generate political, uh, uh, political mileage. And I, I, nothing, nothing that this administration uh, is doing at this point has any 
purpose uh, or any basis in truth other than uh, their desire to exercise and expand, and now that it's an election year, to protect their own political power. And it's really sad that things have come to this point, but they do take advantage of the idea that so many people in the electorate don't really pay attention. Um, and uh, some people say, well, the electorate is really stupid. Well, in a sense, yes, in that everybody is stupid when they don't pay attention. <laughs> including you and me you know i mean we all do stupid things on occasion that's that's why we're not paying attention and that's that's what these people uh in power now are are counting on as far as the electorate is concerned they're counting on the uh, their their friends in the media to uh to put out whatever storyline they choose and uh people take that as a reality or at least some people do but i don't think they're going to get away with it this time so uh, in, in the aspect and I'm, uh, regarding uh, contraception, uh, is there a buildup of these steroidal chemicals in the woman's body that could actually hurt her chances of conceiving at a later date? Well, the chemicals themselves don't build up, but their effect, uh, their effect does in the, in the sense that they, you know, the longer that there are, uh, that these things are in the body, uh, the greater the chances that they will uh, cause all kinds of problems. Uh, the one that's most familiar to me in my research is cancer. And uh, it's interesting that one of the longest-running studies of, uh, of contraceptives and their effect on women's health has been the uh, Royal College of General Practitioners study from the U.K., and the way they put out their studies and spin their studies, they actually have headlines like, oh, contraceptives, they're good for women because women on the pill actually live longer than women who aren't on the pill. It protects them against cancer. So they use the fact that it actually lowers the incidence of ovarian cancer, which is relatively rare. Uh, but it tremendously, uh, but it boosts the uh, the incidence of breast cancer and cervical cancer, which are much, much, much more common. So the overall effect on cancer is that increases it. And the reason why they've been able to get away with this is the Royal College of General Practitioners study uh, was started in the 1960s. And so they recruited women into the study who were using contraceptives who, number one, didn't start using them for the most part until after they had had their children. So the average age of uh, women who were enrolled in the study was 29. And the average number of years that they had used the pill was something like four or five years. Now you have uh, women being put on the pill when they're 12 and 13, and they may use them for 10, 15, 20, or 30 years. And so the uh, results of the uh, Royal College study are not applicable at all because, first of all, the most the, the uh, most severe effects occur on women who take these things before they, uh, they start having children. If you look at the uh, excellent meta-analysis by uh, Chris Callenborn and colleagues that was published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings only uh, five or six years ago, I think 2006, uh, they found that the risk of breast cancer was increased only about 15% in women who used oral contraceptives after they had started having children. But for women who started using these pills before they started having children, the risk was up by 45% as a, 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 a compendium of worldwide studies, uh, meta-analysis indicated. So these things are much more dangerous for girls, young girls and women who use them before they start having children because uh, as, uh, uh, as we point out in talking about the effects of all of these uh, reproductive factors and the incidence of cancer, uh, the breasts are very unique among organs in that not only are they not developed at birth, and we think, or that is the general public usually thinks of the breasts as organs which develop at puberty, but they really don't. They really just grow. So when a girl hits puberty, her breasts start to grow to adult size, so teenagers of 14, 15, 16, doesn't matter how old she is, once she's a woman, she has adult-sized breasts, but it takes 32 weeks of a normal pregnancy before they are protected against cancer, before her breasts 
are filled with mostly type 3 and 4 lobules that can actually produce milk. It takes most of a full-term pregnancy to do that. And unless a woman has a full-term pregnancy, she'll go through her whole life and her breast will never be mature and protected from carcinogens. That's really the main reason there's so much breast cancer in modern industrial society, because women wait longer before they start having children. They have fewer children, and many more of them have no children at all. If you, if you factor in that difference between traditional women and childbearing patterns and the childbearing patterns of the modern industrialized world, you have almost the whole difference in breast cancer incidence. And then add on top of that what the women do in order to pre prevent having children or to postpone having children. That is these steroid drugs that we call uh, with an innocuous name like the pill uh, and, uh, and abortion. And so you, you put all those things together, not having children, or having fewer children, delaying having children until a woman is uh, 30 or 35 instead of uh, 18 or 20 to 25. And, uh, and, and the, the things that are used to do it, these uh, dangerous carcinogenic steroid drugs called the pill and abortion if she does get pregnant in the first place, you put all that together and you've got most of the, most of the incidence of breast cancer. No wonder there's such a public hue and cry that we have to spend billions and billions to, to find a cure for breast cancer because we spend billions and billions to give women breast cancer between abortion and contraception. It is truly insane, many of the things going on in the modern world here. It's just, it's just a, a absolutely mind-boggling how, uh, how, contrary to any sort of uh, real intelligence, uh, is guiding uh, national policy in this regard, and and this, the administration's latest assault on uh, you know on those who would uh, advocate uh, traditional family values and reproductive values is just uh, is just symptomatic of uh, what's been going on for uh, all about the last forty years or so. Uh, uh, one thing that. Uh when I had last spoken to you, and it, it, I didn't realize this, that breastfeeding actually helps to reduce the amount of estrogen in the woman's body. Could you speak to why that's beneficial and how does that tie into menstrual cycles? Well, breastfeeding is, uh, is known now also to reduce the risk of breast cancer. And uh, it does so mainly by... Uh, by reducing the amount of cycling. For, for many, many years in uh, research studies on endocrinology, that is to say hormones, uh, typically the uh, women in the study would be considered, uh, they would recruit for a study, normal cycling women, and you would see this phrase all over uh, papers. You know, we, we recruited uh, so many hundred normal cycling women, normal cycling women, normal cycling women, and then someone realized a few years ago, you know, I wonder how really natural and healthy this condition is to be normally cycling, because we usually view women of reproductive age, which is about half a woman's life, let's say, from age uh, maybe uh, 13 to 15 to age uh, 50 or so, um, as somehow a time when she is usually going through her menstrual cycles. Well, through most of human history, and probably still in a good part of the world, this is not really normal. Because when you have a number of children, um, you have uh, obviously nine months uh, apiece taken away from that time when a woman is normally cycling. But then add to that, after a normal pregnancy, if a woman is uh, breastfeeding, and that's really the sole source of nutrition, let's say, for a baby up to the age of about six months, then for another six months or so, a woman stops cycling. And the fewer number of menstrual cycles means the less amount of estrogen that is circulating through a woman's body all told and that all adds up to a lower incidence of breast cancer because estrogen is generally viewed as the culprit because that is what makes the cells in the breast grow. Now, the, the real uh, correction to that equation is that when you have the, the biggest amounts of estrogen are also when a woman is pregnant. But when a woman is pregnant and she goes through that whole nine months of pregnancy, by the time she gets through the eighth month of the pregnancy, she has now had the breast matured 
so that she now has a permanently lower risk of breast cancer. So the more children a woman has, the lower her risk of breast cancer. The earlier she starts having children, the sooner her breasts become matured and resistant to carcinogen, and then on top of that, the more that she actually breastfeeds the children, that lowers the risk even further. And what has... uh, What's clear and what's also understood quite well from the uh, hormonal point of view is that even for women who are having children, even for women who are breastfeeding children, the accommodation that is made to uh, for work schedules and study schedules such that she uh, she leaves the children, let's say, in daycare or with the grandparents while she's going out uh, to work and maybe pumping her breasts and storing her milk so that the baby can be fed her milk from the bottle. Even that's not the same because the timing of that is such that her cycles will return sooner. Whereas the natural way is for a woman to be with her baby and then to feed the baby whenever the baby demands it. You know, I think of that that image that we see of the, the Native Americans of a, of a woman working in the fields with the baby strapped to her as a, a papoose uh, sort of in a you know in a child seat while mommy is working, and then when the baby's hungry, mommy stops working, feeds the child, and then uh, you know then then gets back to work when the baby is is uh, satisfied. And if 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 the frequency of feeding then is such that she does that, then that really keeps the cycles from coming back. Usually for as long as the baby is exclusively fed off the breast. So the there are many accommodations, and nobody is claiming. Uh, the political sphere or otherwise, that we need to go back to uh, to uh, not accommodating uh, modern uh, modern life uh, or not accommodating our reproductive patterns, our dietary patterns, our sleep-wake patterns to the demands of modern life. But we do need to acknowledge the biology and and what the effects are when we do go against it, such as uh, terminating a pregnancy before it's supposed to be terminated. This has a devastating effect, and it's just ludicrous to deny it and to say, oh, well, this is safe, safe abortion. Oh, these pills are safe, you know, these powerful carcinogenic steroids. Oh, these are safe. They're just contraception, and only evil evil Republicans are trying to take them away from you. And, and I mean, it's just just a matter of uh, of telling people what these things actually are. I mean, if there were just truth, in what we're all talking about when we're talking about contraception. Yes, well, what about the contraceptives? What are they really? Um, and maybe if they weren't provide, provided free of charge to all the women, as these politicians assume, uh, you know, insist they need to be, maybe people would pay more attention because, you know, people take much more seriously things they have to pay for. You get a bottle of pills and you have to pay, you know, 10 or 15 or $20 for it. You're much more likely to read what they are and what they do and to be much more careful about what you're taking. But if they're given away for free, I mean, then it's like trick-or-treat candy. <laughs> and that's pretty much the way they're treated. And it's just, it's just absolutely insane. It is really, really irrational, the level of uh, political discourse compared to what we're actually talking about in terms of what we're really doing to our bodies. Well, now the um, the Democrats, uh, I think they're they're moving. Some think that the Democrats are moving away from abortion because they're realizing it's a losing issue for them. But they're saying, well, contraception is a winning issue because ninety some odd percent uh, supposedly take contraception. What, yeah. what, what, how do you respond? How would an astute political person answer that question? to say, well, contraception it, it isn't good for you either. <laughs> say, well, but, let's say, uh, well I would say that the best way to do it is to get, is to get very specific about it and say, what exactly do you mean by contraceptive? Oh, you mean the pill. You mean those, those uh, synthetic carcinogenic uh, steroid drugs that uh, increase the risk of breast cancer and ovarian ca- and breast cancer and cervical cancer and liver cancer, according to the World Health Organization, those things that are given away like candy that we're supposed to give away for free, uh, even though if a woman wants to regulate her fertility and limit her family size, she can do it in a natural drug-free way just by um, understanding how her own body works and taking stock of some things as simple as her own body temperature when she wakes up every morning 
to figure out where she is in her cycle, you wonder wh- what the uh, what the steroid drug manufacturers have, uh, and why they have such a hold. It would seem uh, on society to insist that everybody's got to take these horrible drugs, and we're giving them to people who are healthy. <laughs> these these are. I mean, let's put it this way: if ever there was a class of medicine that we could consider recreational drugs, birth control pills would be it. This is the ultimate recreational drug. Oh, you have a right to have it free of charge. So what? So you can fornicate whenever you want, wherever you want, with whomever you want, however old you are, and make sure that somebody else has to pick up the tab for the consequences. If that's not a recreational drug, I don't know what is. Hmm. That's that's an interesting way of... uh, (laughs) just occurred to me actually but you know but that's really what it comes down to and of course this can be cloaked in the idea that well yes there may be recreational drugs but there are women who are using it for you know married family women who are using it for legitimate purposes of family planning and therefore you, they can get away with espousing uh, uh, the you know and advocating the uh, free distribution of them and to them I would say well as I just said a minute ago you can exercise full reliable control of your fertility without taking these drugs if you just knew how your body worked with just some some very very simple training things they call uh, natural family planning for example nfp it's not the rhythm method it's very scientific it's very reliable and it's totally drug free mm-hmm. um uh, your area of the abortion breast cancer link, I know we've done some shows be sh- before showing that uh, there's controversy on how some of these studies have been uh, carried out. And um, do you see any, any rectification of that issue in, in the f- near or distant future? Uh, well, it's starting to happen. Uh, and that's, I think that started to happen, I would say, in 2009. Very very recently when a uh, study came out published by authors from the uh, National Cancer Institute who had previously uh, been uh, issuing the party line from the National Cancer Institute, by the way, is a federal agency, so these are not wonderful, uh, uh, you know, dedicated scientists hoping, you know, hoping to cure human disease. These are corrupt federal bureaucrats, let's face it, in the National Cancer Institute, and, and one of them appeared as the author on a paper which uh, showed that abortion does increase the risk of breast cancer. So this, uh, this uh, contradiction, because the National Cancer Institute was still claiming that there wasn't a link between abortion and breast cancer, um, her name is Louise Brinton, who's actually the chief of the genetics and epidemiology section of the National Cancer Institute. So that made a big, um, a little big of a uh, splash that there was this contradiction that how come you've got a, a study showing that there is a link uh, when you insist there isn't, but also between 2007 and the present day, there have been now at least five studies, at least two in China and one in uh, Iran. Look at these wonderful places with the free flow of information so that we can actually learn what supposedly safe uh, reproductive practices or anti-reproductive practices are doing to women. You have to go to the literature in China and Iran. That's pretty scary in and of itself. But you have China, Iran, uh, Armenia, that study in the United States. Uh, so you have a number of studies that have come out in recent years, legitimate studies that uh, that reinforce the link between abortion and breast cancer. There was a period between 1997 and 2008 when there was a whole slew of studies that were that were very widely touted by the highest authorities that came from places like the Harvard Nurses Study and Oxford University and the, and the uh, Karolinska Institute, where the uh, Nobel Prizes come from, all saying, oh, look, our studies show there is no link. Well, those studies are pretty much all fraudulent, and I've published the uh, deconstruction of most of them uh, in medical journals. And uh, if you go to uh, bcpinstitute.org, uh, that's our uh, website for the Breast Cancer Prevention Institute. You can uh, find links to uh, various articles, including my uh, 2005 review article that that uh, shows how these studies are essentially fraudulent. Mm-hmm. So the government, uh, people who are now in power in the government will really stop at nothing. They've been perpetrating a uh, tremendous amount of uh, scientific fraud and misconduct 
uh, just in order to reinforce these, uh, the, the political ideology of uh, what they call reproductive choice. It's certainly anti-reproductive, and its intent is anti-reproductive. These are all uh, dedicated to a population control agenda, believing the nonsense that there are too many people in the world, somehow the uh, human species is a blight upon the planet, and, and uh, really just, I mean, nonsense is not strong enough a word. This is really... Uh, this is really irrational, and that's why I think I think the uh, you know our society is falling apart because you can't it cannot this society cannot be sustained with this kind of message driving our education, our politics, our national policy. Well, Dr. Brennan, uh, our time has come to an end. Unfortunately, I'm sure we could discuss uh, much, much more, and hopefully in the future you'll come back and be a guest. I uh, hope we learned a lot today. Uh, Life Matters, and come on back next week. We think you'll find today's show to be unique, informative, content-rich, truthful, and thought-provoking. Thanks for watching. I'm Brendan O'Connell, your friend for life.